let us bow in an opening word of prayer as we as we begin this morning. Father God, thank you for thank you for family, for friends, for this time of year. Father, we are truly grateful to be gathered around in, in this house this morning. Father, my prayer is that as we delve into the scriptures this morning, that, Father, you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. Father, I pray that your spirit would be here and that um, it would be here in abundance. Father, I pray that you would use me as a, as a conduit to speak your words to your people this morning in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I love this time of year. Thanksgiving, Christmas. It usually, when I was a kid, it started in the fall. Around September or so, and when I was a kid, my, my, so my grandmother used to, my paternal grandmother used to work at a bakery. So naturally, the first thing we would do every fall would be to make pumpkin pie. I mean, that's just kind of the staple around, around that, the, 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 the household. We would make pumpkin pies and it's grandma's, grandma's, the, the grandma's recipe. Yes. And, and that's, that's the, the, the recipe that I've made here that y'all have tasted. That's grandma's recipe. Um, we'd make the occasional pecan pie, which these days is just ooh, way too sweet. <laughs> it is so, so sweet. In Illinois, where I grew up, um, in the Peoria area, there was something called the Spoon River Drive, and it was basically a, a, a drive along the river, and in these different towns, these small towns would just open up their towns. All the vendors would come out with their crafts and their goods and all their home-baked stuff. And you'd drive along and see the beautiful leaves in, in, in late September and early October. And it was just, it, it was a weekend of absolute fun. We'd go out and, and, and partake in all of what these little towns had to offer. And it, it, was, it was always a, a good time. And I think one of the reasons that I, I really like this time of year is because it was the time of year when we were all together. It was the one time of year where all of us were there. Now, this was before, I mean, this was before my parents got divorced, but I mean, it was, we'd go down the street to my grandma. They lived eight houses down the street and we walked down there. Grandma would be, in the kitchen making stuffing and turkey and the entire house would just smell so good. My Aunt Pam would come home, from, well, either Oklahoma City or she lived in Florida and she did live in Chicago too. So my Aunt Pam would come and it was a one time a year that I did get to see her and, and it, was just, it was just that time of year that was just awesome. Everybody was together. We'd celebrate Thanksgiving and then we'd celebrate leftover Thanksgiving on Friday and, and then on Saturday we'd have um, East Peoria my hometown where they have this festival of lights and there's a, a, a winter wonderland that you can drive through there's a a, a forest of, of real Christmas trees that they would bring and fill up a track the, the uh, junior high track and they'd, they'd have lights and all this kind of stuff, but it would all be kicked off on that Saturday after Thanksgiving on with a parade. It was a lighted parade at night, and they'd have all these different floats, and, and, and it was just, it was, it was amazing. But it's not just, it's not just the family. It's not just the family that I enjoyed. I love the Advent season in particular, and Angela, thank you for that, because we need to be thankful 
all year round. It, it does get skipped over. But that thankful attitude leads straight into Advent. And I love Advent. Because Advent is that time of year where we, where we not only remember the first coming of Christ, but, but in my mind, I, I, I attempt to not just focus on the first coming of Christ and the birth of Christ, but I'd like to focus on the second coming because that's what we are waiting for now. We are waiting his second advent. And, and, and that's, that's this time of year that, that I absolutely love. We were sitting in 2019. The fall, of, the fall of 18 and the spring of 19 for me was that, that was the time you, you hear me talk about where God got a hold of me. Well, that was the time of year that... that that was that was that timing that that happened. I had gone through a very rough spot. I was personally just in shambles. Um, I, I, my faith was a mess. My my I was questioning my salvation. I was questioning my calling. I was questioning everything in my life. And God started to kind of rein that back in, in in the fall of 18 and then the spring of 19. And then Christmas and Thanksgiving came around that year after God had opened my eyes and restored my joy. That Friday night after Thanksgiving, we were watching the Polar Express at my dad's house. We we're, we're Dad and I were... Dad, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's our kind of our tradition on Friday night. We were watching the movie. I've seen the movie a hundred times. It's Sherry, one of Sherry's favorite movies. Elf is her favorite. Polar Express is like very, very close to that. So we watch we'd watch it on Friday night, and it's Dad and Donna and, and Sherry and the girls and I and and um, when my brother's there, then he sits down with us. We're watching it. And I was just not even just paying attention to it, we were just kind of enjoying it until one line came up. And it's this line right here. sat back in my seat. <laughs> Anybody need to go to Bath and Body Works? <laughs> That's like Sherry's staple Christmas gift every year. When that line played, I sat straight up in my seat and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. What did he just say? Well, yeah, exactly. Repeat that. Rewind it. I got my phone out and I started taking <coughs> notes on, on the things that I had begun observing. From that point on, there are five different things that I observed that stood out like a sore thumb. I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe he just said what he just said. This is the line. He says, seeing is believing. But sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. <clears throat> I couldn't believe my ears. See, the lead up to that scene, 
the young man, the doubter, we'll call him. He doesn't have a name in the movie. The doubter is trying to get the ticket that he had lost and then subsequently found again, trying to get this ticket back to the hero girl, the leader girl. And they had gone to the front of the train, a train on the top and he was walking across the top of the train and he runs across this hobo character. Um, and, and they have this conversation. There's going to be more on that scene next week because I saw something again this year that I hadn't noticed before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's going in the sermon for the next week. <laughs> um, but we'll touch on this scene later. But he talks to this hobo guy and, and he, he asks him, he's like, do you believe in ghosts? He's like, no. And, the, and the, the hobo character looks back at him and he goes, interesting. And then he disappears. Well, they make their way to, make their way to the front of the train. And they're on the front of the train and, and they're on the ice. And, and a little a few scenes later, they're on the ice and the, the train has tipped over on its side. And, and the little leader girl is falling off the train. The conductor reaches down to grab her. And then our, our doubter boy grabs the train conductor's jacket and tries to pull the both of them back, which he's not going to do. And then the hobo appears and yanks all three of them back onto the train. And then he disappears again. And then that sets up that scene. It says the conductor was like, you know what? There was years ago that I was on this train and I about fell off myself. But something kept me on that train. I did not fall off. Well, someone saved you or something. And they go through that whole, whole plight there. And the, and the Dower boy is beginning to kind of question things a little bit. And, and he's like, well, what, 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 what did he look like? Don't know, didn't see him. And that's when he comes with the line, some seeing is believing, because the hobo had said that line. There's a lot of lines there that correlate between the conductor and the hobo and, and Santa that, that, well, if you ask me, somebody, somebody has read the Bible and somebody has put the doctrine of the Trinity in the movie. Because if you notice... Now, there are, you kind of got to get some past some gruff spots of the conductor and the hobo and all this stuff. But the concept of Santa Claus being the father, the conductor being the son, and the hobo being the spirit, that, that, that kind of appearing and disappearing with the wind kind of thing that the spirit does, it, it, and this idea that, that, that he, he kind of fluctuates in and out, and, and they all kind of work in congruity and... and He's like seeing is believing, but sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. Flip with me, if you would. We're going to be in John 20, because see, the Bible talks about this very thing. It talks about this very thing that the idea that sometimes the unseen realm is more real than that which we can see. We're going to be in John 20. I'm going to read verses 24 to 29. This is the story of poor Thomas. That, that, that man catches a bad rap. He's known as Doubting Thomas. Like the poor guy. I mean, you doubt one time and he just, you know, you're marked for life. And thereafter... Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to them then he said to Thomas put your finger here and see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe Thomas said to him my Lord and my God then Jesus told him because you have seen me 
you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That just gave me goosebumps. Because the Bible talks about that very thing. Thomas doubted. I mean, do you blame the guy? Nobody just raises from the dead. And the one guy that you've seen raised from the dead, Lazarus, was raised by Jesus. And now Jesus is dead and buried in a tomb. He, he, he's like, unless I see and hear and touch, and he's like, I'm not going to believe this. It's a wild story. Think about, think about it for just a second of what we believe. It is quite foolishness as the world would define it. Because that's what Paul says in Corinthians. He's like, what we believe is foolishness to the world, but it actually is wisdom. It's the saving power to those of us who believe. Christ then confronts him on his words, and he's like, put your hands here. Stick your hand to my side. And he's like, because you have seen, you have believed. However, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm not 2,000 years old. And I don't know anybody that is. So that means that none of us actually witnessed Christ raising from the dead at that point. You see, the Pharisees were always asking for a sign. They wanted to see miracles. They wanted to see healing. And do this and we will believe. And and I sit there and I go, y'all have not learned anything because... The minute y'all got out of Egypt, you started doing the same thing. It would have been better if we'd have stayed back in Egypt. Are you remembering things the way that like you should? Because like um, y'all were belly aching because of the heavy workload and the slavery. God, please deliver us. God then delivers you, and then you're belly aching. I mean, God split the Red Sea for crying out loud. You walk through on dry ground on something that has been wet for eons. Notice it said dry ground. It wasn't muddy ground. It was dry ground. They complained because they, they, we, had, we had lentils and we had milk and we had all this other fancy stuff to eat and we're out here eating Quail and manna. Are you really going to complain about the provision that the Lord is giving you? But yet how much of the same are we? Do we complain about the provisions that God gives us? Well, I, 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 I want, I want, I want, I need We need to learn in depth. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because you know what that actually means? It means being content in all circumstances. Because that's what happens just prior to that verse. We need to learn how to be content with everything in every situation that we're in. Pharisees are always asking for a sign. Don't fall into the same trap as the Pharisees. Blessed are they who believe and yet have not seen. That statement goes back to the past as much as it goes into the future for you and me. Genesis 15, 5 and 6. And Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Did Abraham actually see God multiply his descendants? No, he didn't. But he did see Isaac. He saw the, 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 the promise fulfilled there. 
but he did not see his descendants become as numerous as the stars in the sky. He did see it. I am convinced through, through study that Abraham knew about Jesus. I think God told him. Because of when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. And when they went up to the mountain, Abraham looked at the servants who were with them and said, we will be back. He didn't say, I'm going to be back. He said, we. And the only two that went were him and Isaac. Because he supposed that God could raise the dead. It says that in Hebrews. What happens in the spiritual realm affects the physical. Always. The battle in heaven that is described between Michael and, and, and the devil in multiple different places, that battle has an effect in our realm. It does. Like, big time. The birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. We can't see any of it. We have eyewitness testimony here in the scripture, but we cannot see it because we weren't there. We have eyewitness testimony to it. People who have investigated these things and recorded it in scripture. And yet we are here today awaiting the coming of our Savior. Have we seen that realization yet? No, we haven't. Are we close? Every day that goes by is one day closer, I can tell you that much. Every generation since, <laughs> ever since Jesus has left has thought they were living in the end times. I mean, the setup sure looks good, but time will tell. That's really the only, <laughs> the only advice I've got is to keep working, keep doing what you're doing. We need to keep spreading the gospel because we don't know when. You see, all of this, the ascension, the second coming, the birth, Christ dying on the cross, being resurrected, all of this is taken by faith. It is an unseen reality. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean that we can't know that it's true. That's exactly what Christ is getting at when he's talking to Thomas. It's like just because we don't see it doesn't mean that we don't know that it's true. I am convinced to the very core of my being that, that this is the truth. That Christ died, that Christ was buried, that Christ rose again from the dead. This is this is. This is more real to me than the things that I can see right before my eyes. I, 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 I have trouble these days believing what my eyes see. And I trust the Holy Spirit more. Even though I can't see Him. When we talk about faith, when we talk about belief, when we talk about sometimes the most real, most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. There is an, there is an inherent absolute complete trust in Jesus. That has to come. This isn't just a lip service thing. Oh, I believe in God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Well, that's awesome. He's Savior. Good start. But is he Lord? 
Is he Lord? Do you completely trust him or do you not? It's more the lip service. It, 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 it is something that, that comes down to the very core of our being that we know that God has got this. God's got it. God's, God's going to come through. He always has. He always will. It may not look like what I think it's going to look like, but he's going to come through. Everything will be okay. You see, a true objective faith completely upends our worldview. Absolutely upends our worldview. The result is a life that has the fruit as evidence of their faith. It's exactly what James is getting at in chapter 2. It's not about just paying lip service. A true faith. And it's not about works either. Because you can't earn it. It's not about your works at all. This is about your faith. But your faith is going to produce a fruit that is going to be obvious. Compassion. Love. We need to not... Poor Thomas. <laughs> we need to not give Thomas such a bad rap. Because just because, just because he doubted for a moment doesn't mean that he's not a believer anymore. Let me say the same thing to you. Yeah. Just because you have a moment of weakness, just because you have a moment where you doubt, doesn't mean you're not a believer. That's where I was in 18 and 19. I was in a very rough spot. And, and, and I, I had these questions. I had these doubts. I had everything going on. But just because you have a moment where you, you are asking questions and you're doubting and you're seeking, that does not mean that you're not a believer. God can handle your questions. God can handle your questions. It takes faith to believe that which you can't see, but read it in Scripture. It takes faith to believe what Christ said when he was standing right in front of them. I, I mean, how difficult would that be? To have Christ standing in front of you, walking with him, you're talking with him, the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for all along, and he's saying these things, and what he's saying is so doggone difficult, we just, we're trying to believe, we just, I, 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 it just doesn't make any sense why we, 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 we go... We give the disciples such a hard time. It's like, bro, he said it. It's right there. You have the Holy Spirit. They didn't. <laughs> no wonder it's so hard to fathom. I mean, it's just like, they, it's, I, I, Jesus, I can't follow. I'm, I, I, I believe. Help my doubt. I'm trying In our prep for Christmas, the challenge uh, I'm going to leave you with, I'm going to leave you a couple different challenges. Number one, in the prepping for Christmas, unseen reality. A Savior has come into the world. The first question is, do you believe? The second question is, is if you do believe, is he actually Lord? That's the challenge. In prepping for his return, the Savior has risen. He has ascended into heaven. He has taken your sin. He's coming back to bring wrath and judgment. Are you living in anticipation of that return at any given moment? 
Are you living in such a manner that when the Savior comes, he's going to find you harvesting a field? Because too many times we get caught up, we get caught up in, in, in waiting for Christ's return and we get caught up in the timing of it all. The timing doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that there's work to do and we need to get that work done. Because there is a, a, there is a harvest out there that needs to be taken in. We've, we're the workers. We've got to take that harvest in. Because the last thing I want is to get before the judgment seat of God trying to explain why I have received such a great gift of salvation and why I haven't told anybody else about it. Because that is a very real question that will come if we are not faithful in that. Why have you neglected so great a salvation? You believed. What did you do with it? What did you do with what I have given you? That's the big question. It is, it is a matter of, of pride and humility. The opposite of evil is not necessarily good. See, because evil is, is, is pride. Pride is why the enemy fell and was casted out of heaven. That's evil. It's pride. So the opposite of evil isn't necessarily good. It's not, the opposite of pride is not works. The opposite of pride is humility. Christ was exalted because he was humble. If anyone, if anyone had the right to talk about perfection that he had it was Jesus but he didn't he didn't he didn't Philippians Philippians 2 Philippians 2 verse 6 who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. He had every right. But he didn't. Read on. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. If anyone had a right to talk about his righteousness, it was Jesus. He didn't. He did not. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because the correlation to the death on the cross, in case you haven't read through Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, I know. Hard reading. Oh, it's very difficult read. It's all the laws and all the Aves over here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, feel your, I feel your pain. But if you haven't, there is a point in the law where it says that he who is hung on a tree is cursed. He knew that. And yet he allowed himself to be cursed for you and for your neighbor and for the person that you really don't like. But either way we go, sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. I'm going to close with this story. I've got a, I've got a hundred stories of Instances where the Holy Spirit has shown himself in abundance. The most obvious one uh, of recent that I've talked about is, is where the ceiling fell and Holy Spirit protected me. But there was one instance. Anybody heard of the walk to Emmaus or Chrysalis maybe? 
it, it, it's, it's this walk, and it's a retreat away. Literally, you, you power off your phone. You are cut off of technology from the outside world for 72 hours. Oh, I know. I'm, you can't, nothing. Nothing. Nobody. You can't con- no. You can't talk to your spouse. You can't talk to your kids. You can't talk to anybody. And I'm on this walk to Emmaus, and this walk is like rocking me to my core. There's several moments in my life where this has happened, where God has just kind of broken me down to the core and rebuilt me. And in this moment, our group we had we had done. I don't remember. We did something. And we got a privilege of seeing behind the scenes of the walk to Emmaus. We could choose to see anything. And the four of us in our group came together, four or five of us, came together in our group. And we wanted to see the prayer room. Emotions just thinking about it. There has never been something more real to me in my life. We stood in front of the door, and our, the guy who was leading us back there, he's like, Take off your shoes for the ground you are walking on is holy. So we took off our shoes. We walked in that room. And the spirit was so thick. It was, you, you, you could cut it with a knife. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. I have never felt something like that since. The amount of power that was in that room. That changed everything. That was one of those moments where I stopped trusting what my eyes saw. But I could feel with the Holy Spirit instead. It's not that I, I, I it's not that I don't still have issues when he moves to, to listen. Um, I can hear it a lot more clear now. Seeing is believing. But sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see. That's what I want you to walk away with today. Sometimes the things that are most real in this world are the things that we just we just can't see. I, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what sort of unseen realities that, that you're that you're struggling with. But my prayer this morning is that you would lay them at the altar. Ask God the questions, He can handle it. It's okay. God can handle your doubt. It's okay. Ask him to help you.